All right. Um, so first, uh, what is an interstate compact? Well, if you're attending this meeting, you probably know a little bit about them, but I'll go ahead and give some background information anyway. So a compact is a legislatively enacted agreement among states, which just means that um, a compact is something that um, the state's legislature passes and the governor signs, and then the, the state will be a member of that compact. Um, and it's a, an agreement between two states or a region of states, or it can even be all 50 US states and other jurisdictions. And um, compacts are also used to address a wide variety of um, policy areas. So of course they can be used for occupational licensure, such as the counseling compact, um, but they can also be used for other transportation issues, border disputes, natural resource management, that sort of thing. Um, one really common example of a compact is actually the driver's license compact. Um, as all of you are probably aware, when you drive across the border from one state to another, you don't need to have um, a second license to drive in that other state. You just um, can continue using the license issued by your home state. And this is because states have agreed to mutually recognize each other's driver's licenses. And so the counseling compact works in a, works in a very similar way. Um, and so, as I mentioned, um, compacts have been around for a long time. They're used in a wide variety of areas. And um, yeah, so uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, why occupational licensure reciprocity is so important. So um, first of all, society is becoming more and more mobile. People are moving away from home for a long period of time, for a short period of time. People travel for work. Um, that sort of thing. And so because of this increased mobility, um, there's also a need for greater um, mobility for occupational licensure as well. And um, additionally, there have been many technological advancements over the last couple of years that are enabling people to practice telehealth more frequently. And again, um, in order to practice telehealth, especially to practice it across state borders, you know, occupational licensure um, mobility is more, this is very important to that as well. Um, another, another big issue for occupational licensure is access to care. So if you live in an area where, um, you know, access to a certain type of healthcare practitioner is sort of limited, or maybe you need to see a specialist in some field and it can be hard to access that um, due to distance or other issues, um, Occupational licensure reciprocity can, again, help resolve some of those issues by um, bringing more practitioners um, into your area via telehealth or just um, general mobility. And finally, um, uh, occupational licensure is a big issue for many um, members, uh, many members of active military or their spouses because of the frequency with which they have to move. And so um, because of that, the counseling compact and other occupational licensure compacts as well do include special provisions for those individuals to make um, their transitions um, smoother in terms of occupational licensure mobility. Okay, um, now I'm gonna talk about the, the ways that compacts benefit different groups, starting with licensing boards and agencies. So one really important thing to note about the counseling compact and is that states will still retain control of the scope of practice. So whatever a state has set out in its practice act as um, the boundaries for what counselors can or can't do in a certain state is going to remain. Um, the compact doesn't interfere with that. And so practitioners are asked to um, make sure they're aware of what those, those restrictions are in the scope of practice. Um, next, states will still retain control of that initial licensure process, the first, first license that a counselor gets um, that's something that will still be issued by a state. Compacts also facilitate the exchange of licensure and disciplinary information because compacts create a data system which helps states share this information. Um, and similarly, compacts also improve cooperation in regulating the profession because, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Um, compacts also improve uh, cooperation in regulating the profession because of the way that um, the compact pretty much requires states to work together if there's any investigation types of issues, um, the states will, will work together under the compact in order to resolve those. Okay, now from the perspective of practitioners, um, we have addressed this a little bit already, but the compact will authorize um, practitioners, counselors to practice in other member states of the compact, and so it improves licensure portability there. 
And it also allows them to take advantage of new telehealth opportunities, whether that's um, something that they can take advantage of when they're traveling and continuing to work with uh, their home state um, clients, or if the client is traveling, or if they're looking to you know, expand the areas where they work into new states. And the, um, the compact also reduces the effort for um, individuals who are trying to maintain multiple licenses. So rather than having to maintain several licenses in all the different states where they work, they can maintain one home state license and then all the other compact privileges will sort of stem from that license. Okay, um, so now from the consumer perspective, there are a number of benefits as well. First of all, um, the compact will help increase access to healthcare services, especially including through telehealth. Um, and it will also improve continuity of care. So if a, um, a patient or client moves to a new state, there, it will be, um, if, the, if, the, if that state is also a member of the compact, the process for a counselor to get a privilege to practice in that state where the client is located will be smoother. And so um, there's a greater chance that they could have continuity of care in that situation. Also, it promotes practitioner diversity. And so from the consumer perspective, if you have a certain type of linguistic or cultural background and prefer to work with someone who shares your same background, um, it's more likely you'd be able to find a practitioner who fits. And finally, um, healthcare specialists also face a lot of the same restrictions that you know, others, others in the health field face with regard to life, occupational licensure and mobility, um, but the compact will help mitigate some of those issues as well. And so if you are in, um, if you need to uh, see a specialist of some sort, then as a consumer, um, the compact will enable that to happen as well. Okay, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, state participation in occupational licensure. Okay. Um, so first of all, since 2016, there have been 230 separate pieces of occupational licensure um, compact legislation enacted. And 43 states, DC and Guam are members of at least one occupational license compact. Um, 35 states and DC are members of three or more. And there are 15 states that have enacted at least six. Um, so as you can see, um, there are a pretty, pretty large number of states participating, and I'll show you a heat map later on of exactly um, which states um, fall into which of these categories. Okay. All right. So compacts take a pretty long time to get started. Um, as Lynn mentioned, uh, CSG has been working with ACA for, um, I believe, three and a half years, she said, and so um, compacts do take a pretty long time from the drafting phase to the phase where they're granting compact privileges. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to um, all the different occupational licensure compacts that are currently in existence, starting with those that have been operationalized, which means that they are um, already granting compact licenses or privileges. So um, in this category, we have a compact for EMS personnel, nurses, psychologists, physical therapists, and physicians. Next, these are compacts which are available for states to enact and are in the process of setting up their data system and beginning to um, move towards granting licenses, but they are not granting licenses quite yet. So this would include the compact for APRNs, a joint compact for audiologists and speech language pathologists, compact for counselors, this compact, and occupational therapists. Uh, sorry, okay, skipped over one there. And next, um, we have a list of compacts which are under development. So these are compacts that are still in the drafting stage. Um, we are hoping that I believe all, almost all of these, except for maybe one or two, will be available for states to begin enacting in 2023. Um, but these are the, the compacts that are still, the draft is still being finalized before we're presenting it to states. And so the compacts under development include cosmetology, dentistry and dental hygiene, dietitian nutritionists, massage therapists, physicians, assistants, or associates, school psychologists, social workers, and teachers. Okay, um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the number of member states that each of the active compacts have. Um, so there are nine active compacts which are available for states to enact. And um, some of these have quite a large number of member states. So for instance, the compact for nurses and compact for, physician, for physicians both have almost 40 members. And then um, if you go down the list a little farther, then you'll see the counseling compact, which has only 17 and the APRN compact, which has three. 
And I just want to mention that um, those two have been around for the, the shortest period of time. So for instance, the counseling compact was only available for states to enact starting towards the very end of the 2021 legislative session. Um, so most of those enactments came during 2022. And so we do expect that the membership for these compacts will continue to grow as they've been around for a longer period of time. Okay, and here is the heat map that I mentioned, which sort of indicates um, how many states, approximately how many, uh, how, sorry, let me rephrase that, approximately how many compacts each state has joined. Um, so you can go ahead and take a look and see where your state falls. Um, okay, and now I will go ahead and pass it on over to Carl for an overview of the counseling compact. All right, thanks, Isabel. So now we'll go into more detail about the counseling compact, specifically uh, running through the, um, the highlights and provisions there. And then we'll follow up with a section by section look at what's included in that legislation. So to provide, provide an even deeper level of review of what's in the compact. So moving on to the next slide here. Uh, first, just to, to recap again, the counseling compact, it's there to help address the heightened demand for counseling services. So uh, whether that's in person or via telehealth, um, it's a way there to make sure that counselors who are wishing to practice in another state are able to have that authorization to do so in a quicker manner than they may otherwise through navigating another state's licensure process. It also, of course, provides that increased access to care for patients, uh, especially via telehealth. Um, the model that the counseling compacts um, utilizes is a privilege to practice model. So by that, we mean someone who's in a counseling compact state who has a, uh, a, a LPC license um, and they are wishing to practice in another compact member state can apply through the compact commission that for a privilege, which essentially provides that authorization to practice. So your home state license is the basis for your ability to be able to practice in another state. That privilege is just saying, yes, you're allowed to practice in this state that you're applying for. So it's all based on your home state license. Um, and again, it must be specific to those states which are a part of the compact itself. So this model is used with other occupational licensure compacts, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, and audiology, speech, language, pathology as well. And then as mentioned earlier, as of August of this year, there are currently 17 member states in the Counseling Compact. Next slide, please. So there are a number of requirements for both states and practitioners to be able to utilize the Compact. So these are defined in the legislation. Um, and this is not an all-inclusive list, but does provide a good um, highlight of those provisions. So first for the states to join, um, they first must license LPCs. They must also require a nationally recognized exam um, for LPCs to, as a condition for licensure. Um, they must also require um, LPCs to have undergone some kind of supervised postgraduate professional experience and um, have a master's degree with 60 sem semester hours required with that. They must also have in place the ability to uh, receive um, and investigate complaints regarding any of their licensed providers. Next slide, please. For practitioners, um, as stated earlier, they must be in a uh, license in a state that is a currently a compact member. Uh, they must have either a social security number or a national um, ID number to um, identify them for the means of the data system and issuing that privilege to practice. Uh, there must be no adverse actions against their license within the past two years. Uh, whenever they go through that initial compact privilege process, they have to go undergo an FBI background check. And important to note here is whenever they are practicing in another compact member state, they're adhering to the scope of practice of that state of which they're practicing. So um, that, of course, can vary from state to state, but is you know all matters of where the services are being rendered of as to which scope of practice applies for that that particular state and service. Also important to note that continuing education requirements um, that the practitioner has to adhere to their home state's uh, requirements. So if they have a uh, privilege of practice in three other states, they do not have to complete those additional continuing education requirements. It's just their home state that they have to worry about for that. And then again, um, that privilege of practice model um, serves as a, an equivalency to a license and essentially is there to provide a recognition 
among member, member states for a home state license. Next slide, please. For state licensing boards, a few important things to note here is one, they retain control of the scope of practice. Um, as mentioned earlier, the initial licensure process uh, does not change with a state's participation in a compact. So um, if someone is in a compact member state, but they do not wish to apply for a compact privilege, they would just go through the initial licensure process as normal um, and would not have to um, do any additional steps because their member is, is a part of the counseling compact itself. State licensing boards also receive um, access to that centralized compact data system. So this is there to um, help facilitate that issuance of uh, the privilege to practice, as well as sharing any kind of adverse actions that may um, occur against the license or sharing information regarding an investigation. And then state licensing boards will also be the ones to appoint a counseling compact commissioner who will be part of the counseling compact commission, which oversees the operations of the compact. Next slide, please. So yeah, again, the Interstate Commission, so that is made up of the delegates, um, who again are the licensing board members or administrators um, of compact member states. So each state who's a participant in the Counseling Compact um, will have one delegate that they can appoint to the co Compact Commission, and they'll oversee the operations. So that includes a committee structure, which has an executive committee, um, a communications committee, finance, so overseeing those type of operations. Um, and so the Counseling Compact right now is in the process of um, meeting for the first time. Um, October will mark that inaugural date for the commission to meet and those delegates to start that process of setting up those committees and the functions of the commission as it works towards being able to issue privileges for those counselors who are interested uh, in those in the compact provisions. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and we also wanted to provide a visual look at what it means if a uh, LPC wanted to apply for privilege to practice. Um, so first, um, you would start with applying for your home state license. Again, that process does not change with a state's participation in the compact. Um, so having meet all the requirements for that, your home state will issue that license. And if at that point you do wish to seek a privilege to practice to be able to provide services in another compact member state, uh, you would apply through the commission um, and making sure that you have all those requirements that are met. So, for example, if there's a jurisprudence exam that may be required in another state, uh, you may have to take that as a condition for receiving that privilege to practice. But that commission facilitating that issuance of the privilege to practice on behalf and for those compact member states, that privilege to practice will then be approved, allowing you the ability to practice in that state of which you're applying for. So if you want to apply in other states um, and receive additional privileges to practice, you would do that each time for which one you wanted to, um, to, to be able to practice in. Next slide, please. We also want to highlight the important provisions regarding public protection, uh, so some of which we had mentioned earlier. Um, so um, for counselors, whenever they apply for that initial compact privilege, they have to undergo an FBI background check as a condition for that. Um, again, counselors must have an unrestricted license for the past two years, have no adverse um, actions taken against their license in that time span. And then that sharing of information amongst compact member states allows for uh, that sharing of information. So for states to take appropriate action and as dictated, um, by the compact and those that are in line with the laws and regulations and process of each compact member state so they have ac access to that information to be able to take action as appropriate. Next slide, please. Another important benefit is for active duty military uh, personnel or spouses um, that there's a special provision in here uh, that they may select um, a state where they have a good current license in and if because of their military service have to relocate to another state, uh, they're allowed to continue um, to be able to, to, to keep that home state license and be able to, to, to work in other compact member states without having to go through a special process to get a new home state license. Next slide, please. 
Here is a look at the current members of the counseling compact you there uh, highlighted in the blue. Again, this information is current as of August this year. Next slide, please. And then just a, a look to how we got here and some information about um, how compacts are created. So again, it's a very stakeholder driven process. So it begins with the creation of an advisory group. So that includes state officials, those within the profession, other stakeholders who through a deliberative process create recommendations as to what may be included in the compact and facilitated by organizations like CSG um, to create recommendations for a drafting team. That drafting team, which is also comprised of state officials and other stakeholders will be the ones to take those recommendations. They're a smaller group than the advisory group um, and, con and convene to create a draft of the compact. The drafting team and advisory group will then make adjustments, um, providing feedback to get it, the compact to stakeholder review. So here the draft, the compact is then uh, disseminated to stakeholders um, and through various listening sessions, uh, surveys and other forms of engagement. Um, the, the, the project group seeks to get feedback from those in the profession, those in the states, regulators, um, as to you know, what, what their thoughts are in the provisions of the compact. And so that's a protracted process. It can take several months for that to complete and make sure that that data is um, identified and then incorporated as needed into the final revisions of the compact. And when that once that is done, the advisor group will approve the draft of the compact and it's released for state. So you can see here for the counseling compact in particular, that process started in earnest in October of 2019 and didn't finish until December of 2020. So this is uh, for the usual for, for occupational last year compacts because of that heavy stakeholder driven process, it does take time for those groups to convene for those different uh, points of deliberation about uh, what is included in the compact to occur. Um, and so that's just a uh, byproduct of those efforts there. Next slide. So again, December 2020 marked when the compact was available for state adoption. So 2020 legislative sessions being the first one where states um, could adopt the compact and Georgia became the first state to do so in March of 2020. Um, another uh, highlight here in April of 2022, um, Nebraska became the 10th adopting state. So within the compact, there is provision that once 10 states adopt the compact, the compact becomes activated, meaning that the um, commission can go about being created and be able to meet for the first time to start the process of uh, setting up you know, their meeting structure, their committee structure, um, working on creating the data system all with the goal of being able to issue those privileges to practice there. So that's where we're at right now. So um, as mentioned earlier, next month will mark the first time the Counseling Compact Commission will meet to begin that process. Um, and after which it generally takes about 12 to 14 months um, after that inaugural meeting for that data system to be created for the rest of the um, staffing and committees to be set up for the Compact Commission in order to get to that point to issue privileges to practice for those practitioners who are in a counseling compact state. Next slide. I think I covered most of these here, but um, as part of that meeting that will occur in October, um, some of the primary things they'll be doing is uh, drafting uh, bylaws and, and rules for the commission and um, start discussing about the creation of the data system there. In the meantime, you can look for updates on the Counseling Compact website. There's a commission tab, which will have um, information regarding upcoming meetings, including the agenda, as well as minutes from prior meetings. And then as stated before, about 12 to 14 months it takes um, from the inaugural meeting to uh, for compacts to usually, on average, begin issuing privileges to practice. Next slide, please. So uh, just to conclude my remarks on this section in particular. Um, so these are really the, the value that states and practitioners and other stakeholders can look for in the counseling compact. Again, facilitating telehealth, benefiting particularly military families, um, but overall helping provide that cooperation among compact member states. And of course, providing and facilitating that um, transfer of, of credentials and, and be able to provide services across state lines to increase that access to care and allow counselors to be able to engage in new market opportunities there. Next slide. 
Okay, next we'll go into a section by section uh, review of the compact. Um, so this will be taking a look at the legislation itself, uh, just to provide you a look at what's included in those. And hopefully that may answer some additional questions you have. But after we get through this section, we'll uh, go through and answer questions you might have um, uh, via the chat or um, unmuting yourself after uh, we call upon you with your hand raised there. So starting with the first section of counseling compact is just a purpose statement, um, just stating, you know, the value that the counseling compact and the objective that it, it, it hopes to uh, be able to achieve um, through the provisions that are identified later on. So you see a few of those listed there. Next slide, please. Um, section two, just definitions as they're used in the compact legislation. Um, so those are useful to reference as you look through the legislation in particular. Uh, you see there, just want to highlight how we define licensed professional counselor, knowing that there may be opportunities or there may be differences across states uh, about how exactly those may be titled, um, but having that general definition as it may apply um, across states themselves. Next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, um, there are requirements for states in order for them to participate in the compact. Um, so those, again, include be able to uh, have licensees pass a nationally recognized exam, require licensees to have 60 hours uh, master's degree in counseling, uh, complete supervised postgraduate professional experience, and have a mechanism in place for receiving and investigating complaints. Next slide. It's continuing along with that. Um, there are certain requirements uh, related to that data system itself, complying with that, um, including notifying the commission about adverse action through that data system that may occur, um, significant investigative information that may be a benefit to other compact member states, um, and then um, as well as having something in place for conducting a criminal background check for someone who's applying for initial privilege to practice. Next slide, please. Section four, um, about privilege to practice. So these are the requirements for licensees in order to qualify for that, um, which we had mentioned earlier. So I won't go too much more into detail here regarding those, but again, highlighting that if there's a jurisprudence requirement in a remote state, being a state that they don't have their home state license, uh, that they may have to um, meet that as condition for that privilege to practice. Next slide, please. There's also a provision here in section five um, for an alternative pathway for someone who may be relocating residents to another state uh, that's a member of the compact. So this provides um, a, a expedited process for them to be able to do so via the compact. Um, so there's further information included in there. Uh, there may be additional things that they need to meet, including a new FBI background check. Um, jurisprudence exams, and if there's anything additionally with a state-level background check as well, meeting those requirements, but ultimately hopes to facilitate that movement if someone is officially relocating residences in compact member state. Next slide. Continuing along with that, there's further provisions that if, or just clarifying rather, that if a practitioner moves to a non-compact member state, um, then they would have to go through that uh, that usual process that state has to receive a single state license, being that that new state is not a member of the compact. So just kind of clarifying that for for um, those who may utilize the compact, knowing that um, it's these are just a, a benefit to your, to you if you're in a counseling uh, compact member state or for moving to one. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, as, as mentioned earlier, um, here in section six, we have special provisions for active duty military personnel or their spouses, um, allowing them to designate a home state for the duration of the service members act active duty um, to be able to utilize that as their home state without having to apply for a new home state license if they're physically relocating. Next slide, please. Section seven is acknowledging the important role of telehealth also in counseling services. So making clear that the counseling compact and that privilege of practice applies to telehealth services as well as part of that authorization to practice in another state. Next slide, please. 
Uh, and then lastly, for at least my part here, before I turn over to Isabel regarding adverse actions, it's important to note that for a home state, uh, practitioners home state, they're the only ones that can take action against that uh, practitioner's uh, home state license. Now, remote states can take action against the privilege to practice uh, based on information they may receive. And as long as it falls along with home, that state's laws and regulations and their due process. But as far as that home state license, um, that is for the home state itself to take action against. And if that would occur, then that would deactivate the not only the home state license, but also the privilege to practice in each state um, that that practitioner may have had a privilege from before. Uh, next slide, please. There's also provisions in this section regarding the ability for compact member states to engage in joint investigations and share information to each other. Uh, that may be beneficial for them to learn about and take appropriate action. Next slide, please. All right, so I will be taking over for the second half of the discussion of the legislation. Um, and we will start on with section nine, establishment of the Compact Commission. So this section just outlines the composition and powers of the Compact Commission. And I don't think we've really talked about this before, but essentially the Compact Commission will be composed of one delegate from every member state of the Compact. So the state's board or agency, which is responsible for regulating the counseling profession in that state will be the one to um, appoint the delegate. And then at commission meetings, each delegate will have one vote on commission affairs. And the commission will um, be able to establish a term of office for delegates and also term limits. And um, sometimes legislators are a little concerned about why the compact doesn't already have um, these established. And the reason for that is just because, you know, the drafters of the compact know that it's important for the states and the state commissioners themselves to be able to decide those things because, um, you know, we want to, this, this compact belongs to the states. And so we wanted them to be able to decide that. Um, the drafters didn't want to put that in there um, and, you know, tie their hands in that way. Okay, um, let's see. And okay, there's one more slide on the establishment of the Compact Commission. Um, so on this slide, I just want to highlight that the commission, of course, as I mentioned, has um, one delegate from every member state, but um, there will also be an executive committee of the commission, which meets on a more frequent basis. And there will be seven commissioners exec elected to serve on the executive committee and then up to four non-voting representatives from national professional organizations were there to advise the commission. Um, and also I want to mention as well that all committee meetings or full commission meetings are open to the public. Um, they are, information about them is posted online beforehand according to public notice requirements, and they will only go into a closed session of the meeting if the compact legal counsel certifies that they're discussing a particular matter, which does require them to be in a closed session. But other than that, all of the information about compact commission meetings and committee meetings are open to the public. Okay, and next we're gonna talk about the data system. So again, this data system is one of the really big um, essential key components of the compact. Um, so member states are required to submit uniform data sets to the data system, um, and this includes information about licensure, um, practitioner eligibility to participate, adverse actions, significant investigative information, etc. the types of things that um, states would want to know before granting a compact privilege. And um, also, we often get some questions about the FBI background check in this section, um, so I just want to emphasize that the, the information or res, um, the, the actual details or results of the FBI background check will not be entered into the data system. The only information that will be entered into the data system is whether or not um, there is something in those results that would disqualify them from having a privilege. But the, the FBI background, the, the details of the background check will not be entered into the data system. Um, and so, um, other than that, um, oh yes, I, I wanted to mention also that um, adverse actions are um, asked, uh, you know, states are asked to include those as well, but um, once the, the time has passed or all the requirements have been fulfilled, that would um, 
uh, remove the adverse action from that practitioner's record, then it will also be removed from the data system as well. Um, and additionally, um, member states can designate that there are certain information that they're putting into the data system that should not be shared with the public, cannot be shared with the public, um, and that can only be shared with other member states. Um, and so, um, yeah, so that's something also good for state administrators to know. And um, finally, this information, the stuff in this data system is just shared between member states. So if there's a state that has not joined the compact, um, they will not be a part of that data system. Okay. All right, now we're going to move on to the rulemaking section. This is another section where we get a number of questions, particularly about the scope of um, rules that the Commission can make. So I just want to emphasize right off the top that rules are limited in scope. Commissioners can only make rules um, about compact administration or the business of the, the <clears throat> sorry, the business of the Commission. And if they do make a rule or attempt to make a rule that goes beyond that scope, then the rule will be considered void and not valid. Um, however, rules do carry the force of law in all member states as the compact is enacted you know, through the state's um, legal standard legal enactment process. And um, again, if there is a rule that states do find particularly egregious um, or concerning, then a simple majority of member states can veto a rule. Um, this doesn't happen. Uh, you know, this is very unlikely to happen, but we do have a provision in there just in, in the case that it, it could occur. Um, and also another important thing to know about rulemaking is that much like rulemaking for state boards, there are um, very strict notice requirements for compact rules. So the rules will be posted 30 days before the vote where the rulemaking, the, the proposed rulemaking change um, would yeah, be voted on. And um, there will also be a hearing if either 25 people or an organization representing 25 people requests for there to be a hearing. Um, and uh, yeah, and then again, I just emphasize here that if the commission does issue a rule that exceeds its authority, then the rule will be void and will have no force or effect. Okay, now we're going to move on to oversight, dispute resolution, and enforcement. And so this section, we sort of describe it as the, the teeth of the compact. This is what allows um, the commission to make sure that states are complying with the compact. So um, if member states are not complying, if there is an issue with the data they're submitting or other types of issue, typically um, a state that notices the issue might just get in touch with them and ask them you know, if there's some type of issue going on um, or if they can make sure to update the information that's missing. And you know, most of the issues are resolved without having a, a serious or formal um, dispute occur. However, um, if there is a problem that goes on, then um, there will be a period of technical assistance where the Compact Commission works with that state that's out of compliance to try to get things back on track. Um, and then there are additional dispute resolution processes that the, the compact will use to try to make sure that they're, they're doing everything possible to help the state um, work through the issues that it's having. Um, but if there is an issue that can't be resolved, and, and the, this hasn't occurred for any occupational licensure compact, I believe, but sometimes it can occur for other compacts if there's an issue, particularly with the state paying any fees it might owe the commission as a member of the compact. Um, then, then there will be um, a way for the state to be terminated um, from the compact and um, will no longer be considered a member state. Um, but the commission will definitely attempt to resolve any, any disputes that arise before taking such an extreme um, action there. Okay, so now we have um, date of implementation, withdrawal and amendment. So as Carl mentioned, the compact goes into effect once it's enacted by 10 states. So for us, this happened when Nebraska enacted the compact in, in the spring. And um, the, so at that point, that was when we began working to arrange the first meeting of the commission. Um, and so states that join after the first commission meeting where, this, where the, the commission has already adopted some rules and bylaws, um, those states will also be subject, subject to those rules of the commission when the compact becomes law in those states, because again, um, the compact is also a law in those states. 
And also, if a state decides to no longer be a member, they can enact a law stating that. And um, the member states also may amend the compact if um, if something you know very concerning if they if they find something very concerning in the compact, then they can enact then they can amend it. Um, but it has to be changed that way in all of the it has to be changed in all of the states before it can take effect. And um, this is also exceedingly rare. It happened once for the nurse licensure compact, but um, because it can be quite difficult um, as any legislators or anyone who's uh, you know, worked with the legislator can be uh, knows that it can be quite difficult to get those sorts of changes enacted in a state's legislature. So that's why the drafting team and all those working on the compact work very hard to make sure that there are not um, not such issues that would arise. But in the case that there is, we do have a permission to provide for that. Okay. Um, and okay, next we're going to talk a little bit about construction and severability. So first of all, um, I want to mention again that. And if there is a conflict between the compact and a, other state laws, um, the compact will supersede state laws in that case because it is also a state law and it's a newer state law. Um, and so um, if there is a conflict with the state's constitution, however, the state's constitution would um, supersede that. And if there is a case where there is found to be a conflict between the compact and the US constitution, then that com that um, provision of the compact would be um, voided. However, the rest of the provisions of the compact would remain valid for all member states. Okay, and finally, um, the final section of the compact, binding effect of compact and other laws. So again, this reiterates that licensees have to adhere to the laws and regulations of the state where they are practicing, including the scope of practice. Um, so, you know, licensees are responsible, again, for knowing those boundaries, knowing what they can and can't do in the state where they're practicing. And also, um, uh, yeah, another final reminder to states that the rules and bylaws of the commission are binding to those states as well. Um, and, okay, I think that is all I really needed to say in that section. So, at this point, we will go ahead and take questions for a couple of minutes, and then um, we will take a break. I see we have a large number of questions in the chat. Um, I also see that Carl has been responding to some of those, so I will take a second to read through some of these and answer yeah. some that, oh, Carl, did you want to? Oh, yeah, I think we, I think we were able to address most of those in the chat, and thanks to Lynn for also monitoring that and answering, um, while we were going through those sections. Um, uh, one at the top of the chat list, a question regarding, um, does this mean that the cost of activating the compact for an individual may reduce this person's licensing costs across states? Um, great question. Um, so yes, um, with the compacts and what we've seen from other occupational licensure compacts is that, you know, reduction in what that cost would be, um, for someone to, um, seek licensure in another state without something like the compact itself. So that cost of meeting those additional requirements and navigating other um, things necessary to get licensed in another state without that facilitation through a compact, uh, whether that's a um, uh, privilege of practice model, whether that's a multi-state license model, the intention is for that to reduce the cost of it by facilitating and, and helping that, that duplication of, of requirements or having those uniform standards so someone doesn't have to specifically um uh having to go through the, the extra cost that may be needed to achieve those um as defined in the compact there so hopefully that answers your question but be happy to clarify further if you had uh, additional thoughts or questions um question at the end here of the chat um is there a list of states who are considering joining the compact we do not have an official list of states um i know that there are you know varied interests across those who haven't already joined some that may have introduced legislation this past session or in ones prior there um so um is i don't believe we have the introduced legislation on the compact map currently is that correct um, so on the on the website, you can go and see which states have introduced it and did not pass it this session, as well as which states have introduced and passed it. Um, the map on our presentation just included those states which have passed it. Um, but as Carl kind of mentioned, you know, 
some some states may be interested in joining and then run out of time or have some other issue arise. And so we we don't have any type of official list of states that are considering joining because the legislative process is just so unpredictable that um, we yeah we we don't typically make those types of lists. Um, and, and one thing to find out more information on that um, is to engage with your state association who may have um, good information to share about um, past uh, attempts uh, to pass the compact in that state in particular, or maybe movement for 2023. Okay. Um, so next to answer Michelle's question, will this recording be available? Yes, we will be posting it on the compact website. Um, probably not until the beginning of next week, but it will be available um, for your colleagues to watch. Um, okay, Maria, um, I see you mentioned you have two questions regarding specific parts of the, the compact. Um, I, I would like to invite you to either um, type those up in the chat or email us, or if you'd like to come off of mute and just um, ask the questions, if you would like to do that at this time, please feel free to go ahead. Um, okay, I, I'll uh, assume that you're maybe typing those up for now. Um, it, no, it looks like she was trying to talk, but I think she's oh, on. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. I couldn't There's see. a section of the document that you reviewed today that talks about um, the boards, the state boards selecting, I believe it's the representative. Is that correct? Yes. From each state? Uh, already the boards have, the state board have incredible power. Why you don't, have you thought about the possibility of making that a process in consultation with the counseling associations of their respective state? Yeah, so to answer that, um, the that provision of the compact was created from a um, that that advisory group and that drafting team and through that heavy stakeholder engagement process um, and to incorporate different viewpoints about how that should be handled. I will say from the compact commission and how that's handled through other licensure compacts that is uh, par for the course that the licensing board members or administrators be the delegates um, as part of that. Um, just given their on the ground knowledge regarding um, uh, the, the the licensure process in their state, and they will be the ones to administer certain provisions of the compact. Um, there are within the compact itself uh, provisions for ex officio members of the compact commission to be selected by those delegate members as well. So um, I will just, yeah. And just they will have vote? They will have voting rights? Ex officio members will not have voting rights. So we're in the same spot that we're in now, which is LPC boards controlling most of the most important issues impacting counselors. Well, that's that's a point that I wanted to make. Okay, thank you for the comment. Uh, the, the, the other question that I have is regarding, there's a section and I believe that section is 10. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's 10, but it, it's one of the section regarding what happens when a state is not complying with the basic obligations of being part of the compact? And I believe you mentioned, if I'm, if I'm wrong, you tell me. And I read it as if a state doesn't, they're given a certain assistance, but there's a point where they're gonna be terminated by, because they're not complying. Is there a possibility of adding a, provis a provisionary period for that state that is not complying because maybe they just need a year of probation status so that they can shape up. But it goes directly from examining the violations to immediately terminating them. So I can go ahead and take this one. That's uh, There would definitely be a grace period or a period where the commission would work with them to make sure that, you know, like if it's a technological issue or sometimes there's sometimes issues of like, the state's data system not communicating well with the commission's data system or something like that. So there's definitely a period of time where the states will work towards resolving what the issue is. And like I mentioned, um, it's very uncommon for states to be terminated from a compact. And I believe it has never happened for an occupational licensure compact. It's only happened for other compacts. And the only case where states were actually terminated in those was if they were just outright not paying the fees that they owed the commission. And so if it's just if it's on some other sort of issue, like, um, you know, they're struggling to 
um, just get onboarded onto the compact or that type of issue, then this the compact will the compact commissioner will certainly work with them and um, help resolve the issue. So I think it's um, I think the a concern that you know a state would be terminated very quickly is it's very you know that's not something that the commission would um, do. That's um, very unlikely to happen. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, uh, there is usually a compliance committee from the commission that is dedicated to working with states. If there is an issue that's identified, working with them to get that that rectified. Yep. Um, okay, Carl, do we wanna work through a couple more questions and then go to the break or do we want to go ahead yeah, and take- Yeah, uh, I think we can address um, a couple ones that I saw here, I think fairly quickly. Okay. Uh, first, would the PowerPoint be available as well? Yes, we can make that available um, mm -hmm. on the website. Um, I'll go ahead and answer Denise's question. If you don't mind, will newly licensed LPCs need to wait two years? No. Um, the look back period of two years on your license is just only if you've already been practicing for that amount of time. So, you know, for instance, if you've been practicing like just for three months, then we would look back on the three months that you've had your license. But it's not, um, there would not be an issue of needing to wait two years. Okay. Um, we also got a message about does a counselor need to be aware of the laws of other states beside their home state? Yes, so um, if you are practicing in another state, you will need to be aware of that state scope of practice and you will need to um, make sure that you are remaining within the boundaries of that state scope of practice. And so again, this is like very similar to the driver's license example. You know, for instance, I, I, I live in Kentucky and if I were to drive across the border into Tennessee and be driving around on some road and you know, going over the speed limit and I got pulled over, I can't just tell the cop, well, in, in in Kentucky would be a higher speed limit. You know, I have to, I have to still obey the rules of the road there. And so it's the same way for this. Um, okay, and then we also have the question um, from Suzanne, is the privilege to practice fee subject to legislative approval by each, each state legislature? Um, actually, I'm not 100% sure about this one. I, uh, I know we say that the states will typically decide the, the compact fee. Um, Carl, do you know? Um, yeah, as well, I, I, yeah, I would add for, especially um, what we've seen from other occupational lecture compacts and just from the provisions of the compact itself, providing the authorization um, for the, um, the, that for the provisions of this to be administered by the licensing boards via the commission, via, via uh, the uh, utilization of the licensing boards issuing that privilege to practice. So um, that would not require um, legislative approval um, unless there is some specific provision um, for that state that that would need to be handled that way. I think there may be a possibility that it could occur, uh, but it's not explicitly stated that that is um, the case in the compact. I wanted to go back to the um, issue of independent practice because I read that question differently, Isabel, and provided a different answer. Um, so, Lynn, so, I was responding to a direct message, actually, but oh, okay. I was just answering it because I figured mother, other people may have the same. But if you want to go ahead and talk about that one as well, I'm sure everyone would appreciate it. Okay, so I read the question as being newly licensed, meaning you just got your license. That it, to participate in the compact, you have to be able to practice independently. So that means you have to have had those two years of supervised or whatever the requisite number of hours of supervised experience your state, your home state requires in order to participate. So if you've just graduated from school and you've, you're working as a graduate counselor, whatever that designation is in your state, you cannot participate. But as soon as you're able to participate independently, then you can take it advantage of the privilege at another state. Yes, thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, yeah, because when I when I read that question, I thought it was about um, uh, because we have a, a statement in the compact about having a two-year look-back period on a license, some people are concerned that if they don't have a two-year look-back period on their license, then they might not be able to participate. That's not the case. However, you do need to be um, able to practice independently. And so if you have like as Lynn mentioned, the period of um, supervision, then you would not yet be able to participate in the compact. Okay, all right. I think we're going to go ahead and move to a break. Um, yeah, so um, to keep with our agenda, um, we'll take a break and reconvene at a quarter past the hour, so 2.15 Eastern time. All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started again. All right, great. Thanks again.
All right, uh, moving on then to our next speaker. So we have with us here today, uh, Senator Rogner from the state of Ohio, who was the sponsor of the Counseling Compact bill there for the 2022 legislat legislative session in Ohio. So uh, Senator Rogner is currently serving her first term in the Ohio Senate after serving four terms in the Ohio House from 2011 to 2018. And then uh, previously from that served as an elected member of the Hudson City Council from 2005 to 2010. Prior to her time in public office, Senator Rogner worked as a management consultant at McKinsey and Company, serving global clients on performance and strategic issues. She was also a field engineer and project manager for Westinghouse Power Generation Service Division. Senator Rogner has a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Tufts University and holds a Master of Business Administration degree from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so we welcome Senator Rogner and I uh, will turn it over to you for comments. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. I appreciate that. I appreciate your flexibility in terms of timing as well. Uh, so as you mentioned, I've been in the legislature now for 12 years, eight years in the House, and four, I'm in my fourth year in the Ohio Senate. Um, this last General Assembly in Ohio works on two year, uh, a two-year cycle, so each biennium. Uh, a passion of mine has been working on uh, occupational licensure reciprocity. So I um, introduced a bill that would be full on um, occupational licensure reciprocity for all licenses in Ohio. And we have like over 640 of them. But that bill was a big bite of the apple. It was in many ways too big. Um, although we have, we got that bill got through the Senate recently and is now percolating over in the house. But um, the, in the meantime, um, I was introduced to, also in the last General Assembly, I was introduced to the Nurses Compact. So occupational licensure for nurses. And um, I started that bill last year, the Ohio Nurses Association opposed it. So I was like, shoot, this, I mean, this, it makes all kinds of sense. All these states are, are uh, allowing these nurses to practice uh, between states and, and why on earth would they, would they not be on board with this? But uh, I worked with them and then, the, then this General Assembly, I reintroduced that bill, the Senate Bill 3, uh, and now the, the Ohio Nurses Association came on board as a proponent. We ended up having everybody as proponents for this bill, and it ended up passing uh, virtually unanimously in the Ohio Senate. I was like, well, that was cool. So we got the nurses done. But then the next thing you know, we did the physical therapists. So that was Senate Bill 5, um, We and that, that got passed. And then I did Senate Bill 6, which was for physicians. Um, and the doctors loved that, too, all the hospitals. I mean everyone's coming on by now at this point we've got three of them passed um you know the legislature is kind of getting used to yeah this makes sense we love this and and each subsequent bill we passed uh, for as far as compacts went faster and faster senate bill um or teresa gavaron did uh, the site the side pack for psychologists then there was a speech and audiology one um then i introduced another one so my fourth compact was uh for occupational therapists and then the last one I did was for counselors. And that, um, that was Senate Bill 204. And that was of course to facilitate the practice of licensed professional counselors. Uh, and we, we would love to have been one of the first 10 states because it takes the 10 states of course to make a compact effective or um, initiate it. And also those top 10 states are part of the rulemaking process, but we were shortly thereafter. Um, so I think the 10th state joined in April, right? Or passed our legislation in April. And I think we passed ours in like May or June of this year. Uh, so we're really proud, happy to do so. Uh, and as I said, when it came to this particular bill, the, the counseling compact, I would say this was probably the easiest one we had to pass just because it was one of the last ones that we did. And at this point, the every member of the House and Senate, Republican and Democrat, they were on board. They're like, oh yeah, we know what that is. Oh yeah, the Department of Defense supports it, and so does everyone else uh, because it provides economic mobility for the professionals. It increases access to care for the patients. I mean, it really truly is a win-win. So um, yeah, yeah. While you know you can, I was listening to the earlier conversation. You certainly can use a lobbyist if you like to, and, and they're wonderful people and they're very knowledgeable. Uh, in, if you go to a state where you've had several of these already passed, you don't need a lobbyist <laughs> because. The uh, and my lobbyists will be very mad I said that probably, but 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 the legislators are going to be familiar with these compacts um, and and 
for the most part, they're, they, they fly through. We haven't had any problem with any compact since the nurses compact. That was the first one. I mean, to get that one through Senate Bill 3, that was a battle. But uh, but again, eventually when the ONA became proponents of it, uh, that one flew through and then the others did as well. So it's smart. Um, it's good for the states. It's good for the professionals. It's great for the patients. Uh, on this particular bill, Senate Bill 204, the counseling compact, um, there were there were no opponents. To part, as I mentioned, the Department of Defense came in as a proponent. Um, of course, your counseling associations did as well, um, as well as some individual counselors. It was all very powerful, smooth testimony. I'm not even honestly sure if the people in committee even asked any questions. I mean, I don't remember. Um, I mean, I was on the committee, but it was it was that easy is what I'm saying. Certainly there were no tough questions. Uh, it was just like, great, when can we start? So any questions? I mean, I don't, I don't have a PowerPoint for you, uh, but I'm delighted to take any questions you might have. Anybody there? If you have any questions for Senator Rogner, um, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. Yes, Senator go ahead, Maria. Kre Senator Krugner, thank you for your presentation. I'd like to know, uh, what would you say are the top three uh, selling points for a state that is on the fence about this? Yeah, no, that's a great question. and. Um, and I'll just reiterate what I said, which is it's economic mobility for the for the professional. So this allows people that have the skills to cross state lines. Um, number one. <clears throat> number two, it's it increases patient access to care. So um, you know whether you're a somebody that wants to travel out of state, but you still want to talk to your doctor or your counselor from another state. I mean, this just really helps facilitate that. Um, and, uh, and it get, really opens up the, the world of healthcare, I think, for a lot of patients uh, that otherwise wouldn't be able to access the counselor or doctor or nurse uh, that they want to. So I, those are the two big things to me. Uh, I know you asked for three, but honestly, it's economic mobility for the professional. It's patient access to care. Okay, thank you. If I come up with a third one, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Senator Rogner, I had a question, and again, if anyone has any further ones for Senator, you can put it in the chat or just raise your hand, but I'm um, just kind of curious, um, and, and it may not particularly apply for the counseling compact, but um, as it may be helpful for other states or maybe from previous compacts that Ohio's considered, has the knowledge of states that are around Ohio uh, been a, uh, a selling point for the your fellow legislators in passing the compact? Um, how much of that is um, helpful for you know your your fellow legislators to be aware of and kind of help get across the finish line? Um, well, well, so yeah, it actually all these compact um, websites, right? Whether it's a nurse, his doctors, physical therapist, doc, whatever, um, they all seem to have a map, right? And and when you go to their map, it'll show which states have are have introduced the legislation, which states have enacted the legislation. Um, and that's a pretty powerful visual uh, because there are so many of these uh, compacts now, the, the United States is mostly all colored in of states that are joining these compacts. So, you know, nobody wants to be left out. It's just human nature. And so when you show that to your colleagues in the, in the House and Senate, you're like, look, there are 35 other states that have already done this or, um, you know, physical therapist compact. They're like, oh, shoot, you know, they don't want to be the one that's left behind. So I. I think it's um, it really once it built it builds momentum and not just so. I, so your question was neighbor states, but it, it, neighbor states are great, yes. Um, but it's it's also the entire United States that's piling onto this, and that's also I think why the Department of Defense is so excited about it. All right, great, thank you. Any further questions for the senator? I love questions. You have to ask me questions to make up for my lack of PowerPoint. Come on, somebody. <laughs> well, well, thank. Well, let me do this. I'll put my phone, my personal cell phone number, into the chat, um, so you guys can all, if you think of something later. Wait a minute. Where's the? Hold on. Raise hand. Coffee. Oh, wait a minute. Where's the chat function on this one? Mm. Can I tell you my? So I'm gonna read. I'm gonna say my uh, phone number, and someone else will type it in for me. 
All right. Yeah, we can do you. that. All yeah. right. So it's three three zero three two two five three two five. And I text, you can call, um, call me directly if you have any, if you think of any questions later. Um, we are at your service. I mean, any of the other states considering doing this uh, would, would be more than happy to help in any way we can because the more states join, the more powerful the whole compact is and that'll benefit Ohio as well. All right, great. Yeah, we have it there in the chat. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and really appreciate your comments and perspectives. So um, um, so yeah, so if you have a question for Senator Rogner later on, uh, you have her number there, or if you want to reach out to CSG, we can facilitate, get you in contact as well. So um, yeah, so thank you again, Senator. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You guys have a great day. All right, moving on to our... Um, Last speaker for our Compact's Perspectives um, part of the Legislative Summit, we have with us uh, Rebecca Cole. Uh, so Dr. Rebecca Cole is a licensed professional counselor and a national certified counselor. She holds a PhD in counseling from Old Dominion University and a master's in education and school counseling from the College of William and Mary. Currently, Dr. Cole is a research associate professor at the Uniformed uh, Services University at, of the Health Sciences in the Department of Military and Emergency Medicine, where she focuses on curriculum and assessment development. Uh, before coming to um, that position, Dr. Cole served as the founding program director um, of the school's counseling program at Arkansas State University, where she developed 16 online counseling and mental health graduate education courses, including two courses focusing on suicide prevention and crisis intervention. Her research interests focus on promoting mental health and wellness within the military community and developing best practices for the counseling profession's work with this population. Dr. Cole has published over 35 peer-reviewed journal articles and has presented at over 20 international, national, and regional counseling and mental health conferences. Uh, so with that, we'd like to welcome Dr. Cole and we have your presentation uh, loaded up and ready. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Rebecca. I'm excited to talk to you today about military spouses. Uh, you want to go ahead and flip. I currently work at the Uniform Services University, so we're a medical school for the military. Uh, our students come here for med school, then they go to residency and head out to different operational environments all over the world. So I'm lucky to play a role in helping to make sure that they are ready to treat um, service members um, so we can bring them back home to their families. Next slide. Uh, this is a really important topic to me about military spouses because I am one. Uh, this is my husband, he's a service member. Uh, this is about 10 years ago. This is my daughter when she's a little baby, but this is one of my favorite pictures um, representing my family and why I'm passionate about mental health services for military families and also a lot of my personal journey of um, being a military spouse and having a trying to have a career in the midst of that um, as a licensed professional counselor. I've lived in Virginia, Italy, Japan, California. Um, now I am back in Virginia in the Washington DC area. So it has been quite an exciting adventure for me over the past uh, 16 years of being a military spouse. Uh, next slide, please. So as a, a federal employee uh, employed by the, the federal government and Department of Defense, uh, everything that I say today is my own opinion and assertion and is not that of the Uniformed Services University or the Department of Defense. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the military spouse lifestyle. We are constantly in tra transition. We could move to a new country tomorrow. Uh, my husband could get deployed at any second uh, to anywhere in the world. Um, a lot of unknowns. Um, not only can my husband get deployed, he's constantly switching jobs. So that uh, leaves me into a little bit of unknown as far as childcare, um, taking care of my kids, as far as uh, how often I can work, what kind of job I can have. Um, 
in my experience, it's been very difficult applying for jobs uh, because people can tell that I'm a military spouse um, and they're unsure of if I'm a good hire, if I'm going to be around for a long time, or if I'm going to move, you know, two weeks from now. Um, I don't know either. Uh, so that's what military spouses face uh, when we are trying to uh, work to build our careers. Next slide, please. Uh, military spouses are really important in the military community because we know all about the military culture. We know the challenges that families face with deployments and constant transitions. Uh, we know what it's like to fear for the safety of our spouses, to not know where our spouses are in the world or not being able to get in touch with them to know if they're okay. Uh, this puts a lot of stress on spouses and families um, and the counseling community is really important in helping to alleviate those stressors and address the mental health issues of families. I did a study last year looking at military spouse suicide because we just found out that spouse suicide is a big issue, um, just like it is for active duty service members and veterans. Uh, we just got new data that it's a problem in the spouse community as well. Um, so this is something that's super important for um, the counseling community to be aware of and address. Uh, in my study, a lot of the participants said that switching mental health providers when they're moving around is a major cause of their stress. And they said that they think that might be causing uh, this phenomenon of suicide uh, within the military spouse community. Um, they talked about how it's really hard if you find a counselor in your area and then you have to move two months later and then you have to try to find one again. And then even if you do find one, it might not be one that you feel like you're connecting with. Uh, they, they said that this was a struggle for themselves and also for their children as well. Uh, to constantly have to find someone new for your child to talk to after they develop someone, a relationship with a counselor um, is really puts a lot of burden, not only on the parent, but the child as well. Next slide, please. So licensure portability would help the military community in a lot of ways. Number one, we have a lot of spouses who have counseling degrees. Uh, Spouses see problems firsthand, they know about them, and a lot of them then want to go and become counselors. Uh, the growth of online counseling programs has been great for military spouses because you could take classes when you're in Japan, all over the world, and you can get a counseling degree. Uh, now the problem is when you're bouncing around, how are you going to maintain your license? But with licensure portability, that's not an issue anymore. You can get some career stability. Um, which is something that's great for spouses, not only for their mental health, because um, they have a career, they have purpose, they have something they're invested in, um, but also then again, for them to be able to treat other members of the military community with consistency. So if my um, daughter is seeing a counselor virtually and that counselor is a military spouse and has to move to another state uh, because their husband is transferred, uh, my daughter can continue to see her with that licensure portability there. So it benefits not only spouses in their careers, but also families to have consistency in their providers. It's really important that we support military spouses as counselors because they are the experts on the military culture and lifestyle. Um, so we know in the counseling relationship, it's so important to make that connection. And spouses know the language of military culture. They understand what the problems are. So if we can provide them with better access um, to the military population and vice versa, we can really get better treatment for service members and their families. And we all know that the better the mental health is for these service members and their families, the more readiness they are. Um, so for example, if I'm a soldier deployed to the Middle East for whatever reason, and I know that my spouse at home is happy and well, uh, I'm going to be less distracted when I have to do things that require my full attention. So if we take care of our families back home, our service members are better able to fight and do what they are asked to do as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so military spouses can benefit because they can keep their careers. Uh, these spouses can provide great care to the community the military community. The military community has more spouses or counselors and they have better access to counselors who are experts and their struggles and their challenges. So they're getting better, better care. Um, we're facilitating, we're enhancing long-term relationships with counselors and dependents. 
um, and their clients that are going to benefit them long term and create better mental health opportunities um, within the military community, and that creates more readiness for the military. Next slide, please. All right, any questions for me? Uh, we have one question in the chat. Um, I think just as a point of clarification or um, um, saying um, from, you said, you, you said Uniform Services University, um, does this include officers in the Indian Health Service? No, uh, just the Army, Navy, Air Force, and yeah. Um, Dr. Cole, I had a question while others may um, be thinking of once putting in the chat or through raising their hand, but, um, and I, this may be something that, you know, you've already identified, but just to highlight it further, are there any, you know, primary misconceptions that you often hear um, from a military spouse and some of the challenges, maybe particular to that workforce mobility piece? Could you, would you repeat that again? Any yeah, challenge? yeah, just, would you, um, is there anything you would like to highlight as far as common misconceptions that military spouses may face um, as it applies to um, their, you know, workforce mobility or anything else, any other challenges that you think there may be a misconception that is important to highlight? Um, I think other people perceive, other people perceive military spouses as being immobile. Um, and I know with me, that's been a struggle as far as, you know, job interview or having gaps on my resume. Um, so this would solve that issue and increase our mobility and our, you know, our ability to get those jobs that we want um, because we can take them with us when we move, um, when we go with our service members to their new duty station. Um, I think that when spouses too feel like they can have a career, you know, I spent my I got my graduate degree in counseling and now I do have greater opportunities. That's gonna be huge as far as morale for spouses, for mental health. Um, and that is gonna be great for the United States military if we have happy spouses. And spouses who can keep their jobs are gonna support their service members to keep their jobs. So this increases retention in the military as well. Um, happy spouses who can um, move around a lot um, they're going to be supportive of the service member to move around a lot. And that is what the United States military needs. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Cole. Any other questions for Rebecca? Yes, Tammy. Carl, thanks so much for calling on me. Um, this message is not specifically for Rebecca, but I just wanted to mention to everyone on the call that Rebecca's story is so important. I work for the Department of Defense and I'm gonna post the website where folks who are interested in engaging with us on this effort to support spouses like Rebecca, with the Counseling Compact can reach out to us. So thank you for just giving me that little chance to make a plug, Carl. Yes, of course, thank you for that. Any other comments or questions? I have a question for uh, Professor Cole. Yes, go ahead, Maria. Um, I'd like if she can talk a little bit about how does she see children of the military being supported when states join the counseling compact? She, I think she almost talked most of the time about, about adults in the family, but what, what about the children? So children, the counseling relationship is so important with children. They, you know, find this caring adult that they feel like they can trust and form a relationship with where they can tell them reveal things to them and um if you have a child a military child who's really struggling with a lot of issues and I know my daughter was was very similar in that every time my husband would leave deploy which was about you know every two months she would become so emotional she would start crying like at school for seemingly no reason like she definitely needed support. So finding her a counselor who could help her, you know, for the time that she needed, which was in her case was a year, 
um, having that same counselor was so important. So had we had to move during that time would be very stressful on her. It would have been very stressful on me um, just to go somewhere new. And, you know, if we moved, we would have to find a new house, a new school, finding a new counselor. Honestly, that would have been like fifth or sixth on the list. So if we had licensed reportability, we would have been able, and we moved, we would have been able to continue that relationship with the same counselor. So that consistency is so key for military kids, especially when they are in a new place. You know, they have to make new friends at school. They have to navigate a new neighborhood. If they can keep the same counselor through that time and get that consistency there and get that support, that is going to be huge as far as supporting their mental health. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right, well, seeing none, we want to thank Dr. Cole for her time today and, and sharing her story and, and that wonderful message about how this can support military spouses. So thanks again. Thank you all. All right, great. Um, well, that concludes our Compact Perspectives portion of Legislative Summit. Um, so from here, we wanted to open it up for any additional questions you might have generally or from the information you've heard today that we can further clarify or provide um, any kind of resources to the, that may be helpful in your state. Um, so want to you know, open it up again to questions via the chat or the raise your hand function. So we'll give some time for that. Um, I also just wanted to hop in to add, if you do happen to think of a, a question later on, you can always just email the Counseling Compact email address, which is there on the screen as well, counselingcompact.csg.org. It looks like we may have answered most of those questions um, after our first part of the uh, presentation. But yeah, again, as Isabel said, happy to be a resource uh, further on if anything comes up. Um, pending other questions, just a few um, further thoughts uh, before we sign off. One, again, from here, it will be the mission of the Counseling Compact um, to get up and running, issuing compact privileges. Over that timeline, we identified, again, that 12 to 14 months after they meet in October. Um, important to note as part of their work is setting up roles um, for the commission. And so with that, it's the work of the delegates from all 17 states and as more come on board to work on that collectively. So this will be as with the work overall of the compact, a representation of the states themselves. Um, also want to just note that if you are interested in where your state's at right now in considering the counseling compact, uh, that we do highly encourage you to reach out to your um, association there in the States, uh, they might have some good information to share out about some of the work they, they may be doing uh, regarding that, particularly with upcoming 2023 legislative sessions. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Isabel or Lynn in case they had any further uh, comments or if they saw any questions in the chat I might have missed. Um, I do not see any questions in the chat, so unless Lynn has something to add, I believe we are ready to go ahead and wrap up for the day. I just wanted to make the one comment that everybody is welcome. As long as your state meets the criteria for participating in the compact, we'd love to have you. That um, 10 states was the minimum that we needed to enact the compact, but our ultimate goal would be to have everybody on board. So don't think that um, we have a limit or that we're not interested in working with you because we absolutely are. All right, great. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you again to our speakers today and for you all, um, the uh, attendees, for joining us for this legislative summit. So again, we will work to have a recording of this posted um, on the Counseling Compact website along with the slides and also, of course, there to answer any questions along the way. So thanks again for everyone's time today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.